So yesterday we did perhaps the hardest manipulation that we'll you'll see in this course because it was conceptually a bit difficult. And after this, everything will get easier. But uh, it may be technically difficult, but that's a different problem. And my attitude is always that if something is technically difficult, we need not worry because with little bit of work, it will come out. If it's conceptually difficult, we need to think very hard about it. So let me write the result of this conceptually difficult step. The result was that in an interacting theory, now I am writing the result in its most general form. So this is the result, where I have expressed it in terms of the Hamiltonian density because that is integrated over d3x to give the Hamiltonian and then again over dt and that t goes, dt goes from minus capital T to plus capital T which in turn has gone to infinity, so we don't write it and as the book of Peskin and Schroeder advises nicely. You can forget about it, but if you ever need to remember, if you ever need to know what is the prescription for the time integral, then you remember that it is from minus, so minus infinity 1 minus i epsilon to plus infinity 1 minus i epsilon. Okay, we only bring it in when we need it. So this is the answer. <coughs> now, let's make few comments about it. First of all, notice that it's completely... normalization independent. Yesterday we insisted that omega among and all the other eigenstates of the full Hamiltonian should be normalized. That is how we inserted the complete set of states. But at the end we have this expression and you see, if omega is normalized, then this denominator is 1 and we need not write it. But if some careless person forgot to normalize omega or if some uh, perverse person changed the normalization of omega to anything else, say 1 million or pi to the 200, it does not matter because whatever it is will be divided out here. There are two omegas upstairs and two omegas downstairs. So any normalization effect in omega is completely irrelevant. Hmm. This justifies the earlier step of saying, well, I identified omega with some exponential of Hamiltonian on 0 and I forgot the normalization factor at that time. Well, at the end, when I have a normalization independent expression, then it is perfectly justified. Okay? And this is equal to that. <coughs> so, this is the basis of this whole expression is the basis of perturbation theory in quantum field theory. And now, today we need to discuss some, develop some techniques to carry out the calculations on the right hand side. Actually, it is funny because you would think that this is a kind of thing that you can put on a computer because all the phi's are nothing but oscillators. Hmm? But because of this exponential, 
this is the real killer. This exponential gives you so many terms rapidly that the even a computer finds it very hard going. Hmm. Of course, for high any order beyond leading order, normally nowadays we do it on a computer, but it's even then it's not easy. It's not straightforward. And for example, if I go to second order in this Hamiltonian, I can easily, or let's say fourth order in that, I can end up with something like 80,000 terms. Okay. So it's computationally very tedious. Okay. Now, notice that the, <coughs> so here now we are going to develop a method, so technique to calculate Actually, we could have developed this technique earlier because it's a technique purely in field theory, in free field theory. But you can see why it will help us in this context. Now, just to be very clear, this x1 up to xn I don't plan to identify necessarily with this set, but all the fields that I want to consider in any term in the expansion. For example, if I take the first order expansion of this exponential, I will get four more fields from h, h is phi to the fourth, right? All of them will be at y, okay? So I will assume that out of all of these, the last four are at y, hmm, special case. Then because it comes from here, there will be an integral, but the integral will be outside, so I will do it last. So you understand that once I know how to do this, in principle, I can control any order term in this because all this does is to keep giving me form of i's every time I bring it down. The complication is that they are all at the same point. Hmm. So when we write this, of course, we never made any statement whether x1, x2 up to xn are the same point or different points. But at least we have the freedom to keep them all different. Hmm. And here we don't have the freedom. All the phi's contained in H are at a single point. All the four phi's are at the same point Y. And as we'll see more and more, in field theory, the worst thing possible is for two fields to be coincident. Okay. It basically what happens is that, you know it already, the quantization rules for fields involve some delta 3. Uh, phi, pi with phi is delta 3 of X minus Y. So delta 3 of x minus y is very good object when x is not y, in fact it's 0, couldn't be better, but then it becomes infinity when x is equal to y. Okay. That infinity sometimes it can be harmless, but sometimes it can really bite you. So we'll see many situations where that infinity is very troublesome. Okay. But those are all words, let's develop the techniques to calculate this and then worry about those other problems of coincident points and all. So for now, let's treat as if all these points are completely independent and separated. And these are all points in space-time, of course. Uh, all of them are time and space and they are inside a time-ordered symbol. So let's start step by step with the simplest one, T of phi of x1, phi of x2. Now we made a decomposition that phi of x is phi plus of x plus phi minus of x and phi plus of x contains a and this contains a dagger, right? So we will insert this in this and expand it out. So keeping track of which terms of phi are creation and which terms are annihilation through phi plus and phi minus will be very useful in calculating this thing. So we have the following fact, t phi of x1 phi of x2 is equal to, first let's use the definition, so theta of t1 minus t2, then it is phi of x1 phi of x2 plus theta of t2 minus t1 phi at x2, phi at x1. I don't know why I am putting these up. Sorry. Too many Greek letters. Okay. So far so good. 
this is the definition okay now i can expand out the definition tediously each of these two by that decomposition of phi into phi plus and phi minus gives me four terms i just plug in each phi to be phi plus and phi minus plus phi minus so four terms so what are they phi plus at x1 phi plus at x1 plus phi plus at x1 phi minus at x2 plus phi minus at x1 phi plus at x2 plus phi minus at x1 phi minus at x2 so here the rule is that 2 is always on the right of 1 because of this theta and then tediously we write down the next line and simply it is with 1 and 2 interchanged okay now let's notice something what's the difference between this and this yes but is there really any difference between them are these two operators equal or not equal because because phi plus only contains a and no a dagger so therefore this is all made of a's this is all made of a's all a's commute with all a's so these two are actually equal likewise these two are equal hmm now if they are equal then their coefficients can be added what is theta of t1 minus t2 plus theta of t2 minus t1 is just 1 so the answer is phi plus of x1 phi plus of x2 plus phi minus of x1 phi minus of x2 plus then two terms where the theta still have to be kept which is this pair of terms keeping with this theta and this pair of terms keeping it with this theta Okay, so it's a bit tedious, but we can just do it. There's nothing very difficult in this manipulation, except that I will keep writing it. Sorry, A's at A's don't have times. Remember what are A's? Do A's depend on times? No. What are A's? A's depend on what? a depends on k so the question is whether a is at different k's commute the answer is yes a k with a k prime is zero a dagger k with a dagger k prime is also zero only a k with a dagger k prime is delta of k physically another way to say it is that if this operator is destroying some mode and another operator is destroying some mode then the order in which you destroy modes doesn't matter similarly if you create and create so only if you create and destroy then there's a chance that you create and destroy the same mode that gives you the commutator okay so this plus theta of t2 minus t1 phi plus x2 phi minus x1 plus phi good so this is the answer that i want to use for t of phi x1 phi x2 it's all this so let me put it in a box with another kind this is time ordering i want to compare it with another kind of ordering called normal ordering which is also useful to define because it will be important later on okay this is another prescription for ordering operators which has a very useful property why do we invent all these prescriptions because each of them is useful for something you will see why it's useful so normal ordering is simply the rule that all destruction operators move to the right and all creation operators move to the left and we don't care whether their time is earlier or later we are not interested in their times we are just interested in whether they are phi plus or phi minus okay the symbol for normal ordering conventionally is two dots 
So this, I can do the same on product of 3 phi's or 4 phi's or any number. So what is this? So I should, inside this I should write phi as phi 1 plus phi 2 and this phi as phi 1 plus phi 2. Now what does normal ordering tell me? Whenever I encounter a pro product of phi plus with phi plus, what should I do? Remember that if I multiply phi plus with phi plus, then the order does not matter, ok. And they are both destruction operators, ok. So in that case, I do not know what normal ordering is telling me because it says destruction operators to the right, but I also do not care because anyway phi plus and phi plus commute. So phi plus x1, phi plus x1, x2, I can write in any order. It satisfies the criterion that all destruction operators are to the right, trivially. Hmm. Similarly for phi minus and phi minus, but if you look at the product with a phi minus and a phi plus, then normal ordering says it must be phi minus at x1, phi plus at x2 plus, what is the last term? Very good, phi minus at x2, phi plus at x1. And if you look at all the terms, you see that most of them have phi plus on the right, only this term which has no phi pluses, then of course we couldn't help it. Hmm. But in general phi plus should be to the right and it does not care anything about time order. So we never said anything whether t1 is greater than t2 or other way, this is normal ordering. Now it is clear I think that if I put many many phi's you can do this exercise, hmm. just write all of them and put all the plus guys to the right, all the minus guys to the left in any mixed term, any term which has both phi minuses and phi pluses, regardless of their arguments, just move the minus to the left and plus to the right. Now, before we use this, let us notice a very nice property, which is why this is defined. Supposing I take the normal ordered product of two fields or any number of fields and put them, put it inside the vacuum, yes. I am about to show you a property. Hmm. The property will show you the logic. So just give me a minute please. Okay. There is a property of this definition, which is the reason why we defined, I just said that sentence. Hmm. The property which I am about to show you is the reason why we defined the rule like this. So let us guess what is the answer to this. Can you try to do it by inspection? Zero. Very good. Why? Good. Thank you. Yeah, either 0 on the right or 0 on the left or both. So this term, this term, this term already give me 0 by acting on the right. That leaves this term, but this term gives me 0 when acting on the left. Some of the terms give me 0 both ways, like this gives me 0 from the right and 0 from the left. Okay, so in general it is always 0. So this is the purpose of defining normal ordering. It is that ordering such that the expectation value is 0. And it is pretty much the unique ordering of that kind and it can be done for any number of operators. So now we have two, res two results, one is this and one is this other one in a box. One is about time ordering and one is about normal ordering of in both cases of two operators phi at x1 and phi at x2. So now let us derive a nice identity by taking t of phi of x1, x2 and subtracting normal ordered of phi x1, phi x2. In case you have forgotten why we have reached here, I am trying to derive a technique to calculate endpoint functions of time ordered product of any number of free fields. Okay? So when I finish deriving these formulae, we will see that we have found a technique for that. Okay, so let us subtract these two. So that should be very easy. Can you see some terms cancelling between here and there? First two terms, excellent. What happens to the other terms? Uh, it is quite interesting. If you look at, so these two terms are gone. Okay, now if you look at the other terms, you realize the following, I can put theta of t1 minus t2 plus theta of t1 of t2 minus t1 in front of these two because that is just 1. Then I can combine with these 
and I find the following nice result. I get a commutator cancels this term with that theta. You just have to do it. This is an exercise for tutorials. If you do it, this is what you get. Okay. Now, where have you seen this expression before? Feynman propagator, indeed. Thank you. So, I derived that this is 0 T of phi x1, phi x2. This is already derived, the Feynman propagator. Notice that this is an operator. This I didn't put inside any vacuum expectation value. This is also an operator. The difference of two operators I found just now I proved that it's a C number. Okay? Is that clear? So there's a rule that T of phi 1, phi 2 can be written as its own expectation value plus the normal ordered product. So let's write that rule and then we'll be able to generalize it quite easily. In writing this, you must be very clear which terms involve vacuum expectation value and which don't involve. Only the last term here has the vacuum expectation value. Okay, so this is one result. Now, whenever you see a result like this, you feel tempted to check it. Supposing we took vacuum expectation value of both sides, what would happen? It becomes an identity. Why? Because the normal ordered one drops out. Great. Okay. So, this is a nice expression, but of course, we learn nothing new about it. Nothing new about field theory from it. And we didn't expect to, because after all, we already know what is this. This is the quantity, the two-point function. Okay, is the Feynman propagator and we already know it. Now, what we don't know is, let's say for example, the <coughs> corresponding quantity involving let's say four points, later we will worry about three points. Uh, let me consider the time ordered product of four of these. Now, are you confident that you could do the manipulation to find out this? Well, put in phi plus plus phi minus and order everything in time. There are lots of terms. It's very tedious. Okay. Because you have to consider T1 greater than T2 greater than T3 greater than T4 and all possible other things. Okay. So it's very tedious. But the answer is surprisingly simple. And I'll write it for you. <coughs> and you'll see that it follows a nice rule. First term is this. After this, you have uh, six terms involving so phi r. So for this one, I'm using a simplified notation which will make life much easier. I'm writing t phi one phi two phi three phi four. So phi one just means phi of x one. Just simplifies my writing time. So now you see how much easier it is that okay in addition you get terms like phi 1 phi 2 0 t phi 3 phi 4 okay how many more terms can you get of this type altogether there are six such terms 1, 2 here, 1, 3 here, 1, 4 here, 2, 3, 2, 4, 3, 4 and whatever are the other two fields will be inside huh? plus 5 more terms. More terms, right? We can have phi 1, phi 3 here, then phi 2, phi 4 here or phi 1, phi 4 here and phi 2, phi 3 here and we are done because these are identical. So, 2 more terms and that is it. It is over. So, this is an identity, painful identity and 
I don't even think you necessarily need to spend all your time in the tutorial trying to prove this. I think the most profitable way is for you to uh, sit in your hostel room and think about it. Mm. If you think about it, the truth will come to you. If you do it on the board, it will simply take one hour, one hour or whatever it takes and of course at the end you will get this. Okay. Now in the books there are good general proofs which allow you to generalize, to prove this as well as generalize it to any arbitrary case. Okay. So those you should look up, but I think for the level of this course and for the amount of time we have available, you can just take this as a rule, that this is, uh, take this as a result without proof. But of course you know it is not a mysterious result because I have defined all the quantities in it. Hmm? It is just a way in which the time ordered product reorganizes into a collection of normal ordered products and time ordered products. Okay? And then finally only time ordered products pairwise. Now from this, can you generalize this? Supposing I had 3 T of 5 1 5 2 5 3, what would you get on the right side? If you had 3, this would of course be 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3 normal ordered. Here you would have 1, 5 outside and 2 inside because you see there is the expectation value of a single 5 is 0. So you have to have 2. So 1 is outside and here there would be no such term. Hmm. If you had 6, then you would have 6 of these. Then you would have terms with 1 Feynman propagator and 4 fields or two Feynman propagators and two fields or three Feynman propagators and no normal ordered fields like that. Mm. So it is good to just have a feeling how to do it rather than actually uh, sit and manipulate the expression. Okay. So have we gained anything by doing this? So finally we have, let us now take the expectation value on both sides and on the left side we get T of 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3, 5, 4 which is certainly something we want to calculate. Hmm. Oh, I should have mentioned that in all this I have dropped the 0 index on 5. These are all free fields. I hope that was clear from the beginning. Ah, our goal was to calculate the endpoint function of free fields. So those are all 5 zeros, but temporarily we have gone to free field theory. So everything is 5, 0 on the board. Good. So if I do this, what do I get? What do I get if I take the expectation value of this? Zero. zero, this, five more terms, all zero, and these? These are there, and that's the answer. Now this result on top is an example, the first example of a theorem called Wick's theorem. And the theorem says, in free, let us write the full theorem, in free field theory, this quantity is equal to sum of product of all pairwise contractions summed over all distinct permutations. Hmm? You see that this is the generalization of this result. It says take any endpoint function, group the fields into pairs and take the Feynman propagator of each pair. 
multiply all of them and every other way you can group the fields into pairs you get a new term. Uh, Let us first notice that we should always call this number 2n because if it is odd we get 0. Remember here if we had 5 1 5 2 5 3 then on the right side one of the 5's was always outside. So we always get 0. Look, look you are all proposing formulae but then check the formula against this formula against this experiment. If it does not satisfy this one then your formula are no good. Let us do it. First let us make some pictorial thing. Let us do it pictorially because this is what Feynman suggested. He said well take n point, 2 n points. So let us put them here. So 1, 2, 3, 4 and at here you have the 2 nth point. Okay. Now to create a term on the right side we need to do something like this. Let us say join this to this, join this to this, then join this to this etc. You understand? We have to create pairwise bonding between any one and any other. Okay. So how do we count that? Let us start with the first one. Hmm? This is at least my method of counting doing all combinatorics in Feynman diagrams. Okay. My method is called, called uh, what, it, what name did I give it? Uh, yeah, method is called jump and land. Okay. Pick any point at random, jump out from it and ask how many places you can land. Okay. Remember that when you pick a point at random, there is no combinatorial factor because finally all points have to be connected pairwise. So you start with this thing empty, 2n points, pick one point and ask in how many places can you land? What is the answer? 2n minus 1. Now you have landed, so cut out that point and the point where you landed. Now you have 2n minus 2 points left. Pick one of those points at random. How many places can you land? 2n minus 3. Good. So that is your answer. 1. This thing is also known as 2n minus 1 double factorial. Now let us check with our result. This one, n is 2 because it is 4 point function. So this is 3 double factorial which is 3 and we have 3 terms. Huh? For the 6 point function what do you expect to get? 5 double factorial which is 15, 15 terms. Okay? But see this factorial growth means that if I take a 20 point function, I will get some absurd number of terms, 19 factorial is a very huge number. Hmm? So you can see how the terms pile up very rapidly as the size of the correlation function grows. So this is the number of terms. Good. So now let us apply this to our problem. The interacting theory 2 point function in terms of the free theory one. Okay. So this is the propagator of the interacting theory but we do not know it. Okay. Now as per the master formula uh, this is equal to so actually this which is what we want to know is equal to this with free fields Okay. And now h is equal to h i of y is nothing but lambda by 4 factorial 5 fourth phi naught the free field to the fourth of y. Okay. So now let us do this order by order. So this whole thing is equal to what is the lowest order? This is of order lambda, this is of order lambda. So the lowest order is I drop both of them. Excuse me. Yes. I thought it was h int was uh, lambda by... Yeah, actually h int was the same thing as a function of phi at a particular time. And h interaction is that thing evolved in time by the free field Hamiltonian. So it is the same phi 
evolves, it becomes phi naught of T n y in space. So, in fact, H int is really nothing but H interaction, but as if it is involved uh, in a free way. Otherwise, you would have to compensate for its own evolution. That would have been another step. So, this is it. Okay. So, to order lowest order in lambda, those two are absent and we get 0 T of phi naught x1, phi naught x2 of 0. So, I will write that as simply df of x1 minus x2. So, we learn that the first term of this is the free propagator as we expected. What is the next term? The next term is when I pull down either this or this to first order in lambda. So, let us pull down this one minus i lambda by 4 factorial integral d for y then 0 t phi at x1 phi at x2 phi to the fourth at y 0. Good. I just pulled down the Hamiltonian up in the exponent once. <coughs> Notice that it is e to the minus i times the Hamiltonian. So, minus i comes down hmm, and lambda by five by 4 factorial comes down and then phi naught fourth goes inside and here everything is phi naught. Okay. And there is one more term in which I keep this, I do not take this, but I take this into account, denominator expansion and that gives me plus, so the, in the numerator I have df x1 minus x2, while in the denominator now I have not just 1, but I have 1 minus i lambda by 4 factorial 0 time ordered 5 fourth of y. 0. Okay. And since this is in the denominator, I can bring it to the numerator. 1 over 1 minus lambda something becomes 1 plus lambda etc. And plus what? Do I have infinitely many powers? Huh? Yes, I am working to order lambda. Yes, yes, I have already dropped lots of terms in fact. So, I cannot keep any higher order terms. So, this is actually the same as df x minus y into 1 plus. This is the most common source of mistakes. So, please be very careful to avoid it. This means nothing but that. Okay, you can't keep any higher order term, otherwise you should keep higher order terms in lambda in the denominator. You should keep higher order terms in lambda here. You should keep terms in higher order in lambda here as well as here. All those things we have dropped because we are working to first order in lambda. So when you work to first order in lambda, you have to make in your mind the equation lambda squared equals 0. Wherever it is seen, I throw it away. That's what first order means. Okay. So, we have got a bunch of terms and now it does not look too hard to calculate because every single thing here is governed by Wick's theorem. Is that the 0 t phi 4 of y is in Yes. Yes. They are all at the same time. Yes. It is going to be infinite. Yes. So, I do not know how you are going to expand it at all. You will see in a moment. Okay. Now, either uh, the, the interesting thing is, okay, you are completely right, it is going to be infinite. But if your worry is that in that case, why am I justified in taking low order in lambda, that can be answered and that can be answered by a very simple prescription which is there in field theory always, which is the following. <coughs> Assume all ultraviolet divergences are regulate, regularized. through a cutoff. The cutoff can be the following. Either the cutoff says that no two space points are allowed to get absolutely infinitely close. 
So, we split the Hamiltonian instead of saying that it's phi to the fourth of the same point, we say it's phi of y, phi of y plus epsilon, y plus delta and y plus something else. Okay. And then we proceed on the assumption that that thing is removed later, but first we do the perturbation series in lambda. So, it's a question of non-commuting limits. Okay. As we'll see, finally all these things end up being written as momentum integrals. You know that in quantum mechanics, short distance and high momentum are the same. So, short distance can be regularized by splitting the points or high momentum can be regularized by putting a finite cutoff. Hmm. And this is a standard assumption in field theory, but it's not very well justified uh, in the sense you can see that doesn't look, um, I mean, it doesn't come out naturally, but turns out is the only way to proceed and it leads to sensible answers. This is one of the kind of reasons why quantum field theory is not a very rigorous subject, this kind of reasoning. Hmm? So, let us keep that in mind. What we will see however, is that without bothering to calculate this term, it will cancel. So, at least this term we do not have to worry about. I will show it to you. Okay. So, how do we collect all these terms? So, the final, the answer is, uh, first term is df x minus x 1 minus x 2. Now, let us collect the other terms. So, this term Now, we use Wick's theorem. We have 6 phi's here. Okay. So, what do we do? We group them into pairs and write a Feynman propagator between each pair. Okay. So, one of the ways is this one with this one and then two of these and two of these. Okay. Or we can have one of these with a y, this with another y and then third y with the fourth y. These are two possibilities. So, first let us write the formula df of x1 minus x2, df of y minus y, this is the worrisome one, because in this case, since both those points are coincident, the propagator goes from y and comes back to y, and two of them. And the other structure is df of x1 minus y, df of x2 minus y and df of y minus y. Is that clear? Now, how many terms were we supposed to expect in expanding a six point function? 15. So, there must be some numbers here which add up to 15. So, what are these numbers? It is very simple. Just think of how many ways you can make this product. Okay. To get df of x minus x1 minus x2, there is only one way, which is that I contract phi of x1 with phi of x2. Okay. Now, for the others, I use the jump and land procedure. There are four phi's. I start with one, I jump from it. How many ways I can land? Three. Okay. After that, I start from another one and jump. No. One. Ah, so, three. So, this is three. Good. Now, let us try to construct this term. Start on this one. Now, I can only jump and land on these guys because I want to connect x1 to y. So, how many ways? Four ways. Then I start on this one, three ways and then the last two are automatically contracted. So, 12. So, did I get 15 terms? So, I am done. That is a check. Okay. So, this is this term and finally, there is plus i lambda over 4 factorial integral d for y, then df of x1 minus x2 and this, this gives me 3 terms by the same counting. Okay. Correct? Three terms. 
This is from the denominator which I expanded. Okay. Now, before we deal with all the unpleasantness of these actual propagators, when we have coincident points, let's notice that as long as we assume everything is regularized, then temporarily all the expressions are finite. And if there's anything which cancels, we better cancel it now. Is there anything which cancels? This term cancels with this term. That's great. So, we are only left with this term. We will see what is the general rule in a few seconds. So, the answer is df of x1 minus x2 minus. So, i lambda by 2. So, 12, this is 24. Okay. Then, integral d4y df x1 minus y df x2 minus y and df of 0. Okay. So, at this stage, the only thing I want you to appreciate is that everything has reduced to product of Feynman propagators of the free theory and integrals over them hmm? with definite co numerical coefficients. This half is very important. It came from 1 by 24 in the interaction and 12 in the number of terms. That's very important. Also have a, uh, sorry I didn't understand, also have a, Ah, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I think I made a mistake uh, because this we have counted twice. It's the same term. So, it's actually this term is over this denominator. Hmm. And this term becomes that. So, df is only once. Uh, it should be because when lambda is 0, then this is just df, not twice of df. But you are right, I had written something wrong there. Good? Okay. So, this is it and we can talk more about how to evaluate this, but we will postpone that for a few minutes. Instead of that, I will show you a pictorial way of understanding this. <coughs> And it's called Feynman diagrams. So, Feynman diagrams are nothing but a way of generating all such terms in a perturbation expansion. So, in a Feynman diagram, what I do is first let me decide what I am trying to calculate. Here it's a two point function or propagator in the interacting theory from the point between the points x1 and x2. So, let me mark a point x1 and somewhere else a point x2. Okay. Now, there are many things I can do. First of all, the rule says that all points should be joined to all other points. Not, I won't put an x that may confuse us. I will put a dot. Okay. So, if I join this by a line, each line represents df. Hmm. So, this diagram is df of x1 minus x2. To lowest order, that means when there is no interaction is the only thing I can do. Now, we will see what happens when there is an interaction. If I want to work for, so I should decide to what order in the interaction I want to work. This diagram is for 0th order. For the next order, which is first order, I keep my points x1 and x2, but I put one interaction vertex here at the point y. Now, this cross is because from the interaction 5 fourths, which I have rubbed out, 4 points come out. This is supposed to represent that h i, the interaction picture Hamiltonian. So, 4 lines are, little lines are poking out of it. Okay. And now, the Feynman diagram prescription says the following. Connect these with lines in all possible ways and count the ways and with every line, you associate a df, Feynman propagator. So, let us see how many ways there are. Here is one point, here are four points and here is 
but all coincident and here is one point. Hmm? So for example, I could connect this directly here, this to this and this to this. This is one way or with the same set of points. Yes. Which one? Oh, here, no, no, they are not, so this is not supposed to touch. Hmm. The other way is that this can join here, this can join here, but this being a four point vertex still has two points free, so it can do that. Okay? Is it clear what I have done? At 0th order, I put the two external points on the board, nothing else, and I said join them all possible ways. Well, there is only one way. So, this answer is df x minus x2, and that is this term. At next order, these are two separate diagrams. Huh? Sorry if I have written them too close to each other. This is one diagram, and the other one. is this. Now there are two things to work out. One is what are the Feynman propagators associate, associated to these diagrams? Second, what are the combinatorial factors? So let us distinguish these two questions. First of all, the Feynman propagators are easy to read off. This propagator is df of x1 minus x2. This propagator is df of y minus y or df of 0. This is also df of 0. So I am getting this term df of x1 minus x2, y minus y, y minus y. Hmm? Later it will cancel, but this is the term I am getting. The lower diagram on the contrary has df of x1 minus y, df of x2 minus y and df of 0 or y minus y. So that is this term. Okay? So if this procedure is good, we should also be able to recover the coefficients this as well as 3 and 12. Okay? But in fact, this is nothing but a picture of what we have already done. First of all, if there is one vertex here, there must have been minus i lambda over 4 factorial to get that vertex. So that we must write down. Hmm. What I am deriving for you is a set of rules called Feynman rules, how to associate a number with each possible Feynman diagram for a given process. Okay. So that I should write down anyway. Now, as far as the possible contractions, x1 going to x2 is unique, only one way. Then here you use jump and land rule, pick one, it has can land in three ways and then you see that the other two has no choice but to close, so you get only three. So you find that this is three and this one, when you start here, you land on four possible uh, lines coming out from here, so you get a four. You start from here, you can land on three possible, so you get 12 and then you close that and you get nothing, so you have 12. So all the factors and propagators and everything are done. Okay? So this is nothing but a pictorial way of summarizing those terms. But now let us get down to the question, but what about the last one? This does not seem to be incorporated by my Feynman rules because it came from the denominator, not from the numerator. Hmm? Remember that last term came from expanding that normalizing denominator. Okay. So for that, I will just give you a result without proof. Again, it is a bit tedious to prove. This diagram is a diagram which we will call completely disconnected. What do I mean by completely disconnected? This part of the diagram, these lines are not at all connected to this part. Even think physically, what does this process look like? Particle propagates from x1 to x2, while somewhere else at an arbitrary point, some virtual particles do something. It does not look very physical. Okay? And the theorem is that the denominator cancels all completely disconnected
diagrams <coughs> to all orders in lambda. So, the fact that this and this cancelled was not a coincidence, but rather it was the first example of this theorem. Okay. Now, this is again something you can think about and you will understand it more deeply when you actually go through your field theory textbook. You are welcome also to discuss it in tutorials. But the consequence is really lovely. This is a rare example in life when two headaches cancel each other out completely. Okay. So, one, forget about all completely disconnected diagrams. So, when we do Feynman diagram expansion, connected diagrams, so we just do not do this. When we look for possible Feynman diagrams, we exclude such ones right from the beginning. At the same time, forget about the denominator. If we had to take into account of the denominator, we would have got lots more diagrams from expanding the denominator. But because it cancels out these, so we forget about both at once. And so we only have to consider Feynman diagrams in which some connection is there. Hmm? That's great. Yes. I wrote to all orders in lambda. What calculation? Ah, cancellation. Yes, I think so. Uh, I think what happens, the way you can think of it is the following. The numerator tells you what is happening when, thank you, it's a very good question. When a particle is propagating from one point to another, in the presence of an interact, interaction, what are the things it can do? One is that it can strike the interaction, which is this diagram. Hmm? What happens is it comes up to here and then it emits a virtual particle which goes there, comes back here and then it continues its propagation. Hmm? It is not the way I said that then this happens, then that happens, all of it happens at one go, but this is what happens. Hmm? Now, in the other diagram, the completely disconnected, the particle is minding its own business. So, whatever else is happening, happening we call it vacuum fluctuation. Hmm? That is some quantum process happening in the vacuum. Now, the denominator does not include any phi's except e to the minus i h. So, it is a purely vacuum process. So, the denominator describes only vacuum processes. Hmm. So, what it means is that vacuum fluctuations factorize from the numerator and cancel the entire denominator. Hmm. And vacuum fluctuations are things which go on which do not affect the particle of concern to us. Well, it is not really because look, you are looking for the amplitude for some process. So, the vacuum fluctuation is a process. All we are saying is that the denominator normalizing the theory properly cancels off that. So, it is not that we treat it as a free particle, simply there is no such diagram. Because the diagram without vacuum fluctuations, we already count, counted in lowest order. That is the free particle term. Df of x1 minus x2, this is already counted. Hmm. This is the new thing, which is the same thing times vacuum fluctuations. But now we see that the same thing with the opposite sign comes to us from the denominator and cancels it. Good. Now, the last thing would be to evaluate this. And you can see that there are two problems. One is, of course, the fact that we have an integral in d4y over these two. And these we will learn how to do one second in a few minutes. Well, a little bit today and maybe later. But this one seems pretty insol insoluble because look, this is d of 0, it is an integral in mod. The non what is d of 0? At least right instead, definite of from here was this. And here there was e minus i dot x minus 1. But put x minus 0, this is, it. This is d of 0. Is that clear? It is only puzzling if you have forgotten what was df of x minus y. We have a formula for df of x minus y. If you put x minus y equals 0, you get this. And now you see that k, if it comes in large number, grows like a fourth power, denominator grows like a second power. So it looks highly divergent. Moreover, since there is no exponential factor, 
there is no way that you can think of closing a contour or something that doesn't seem to help either. So it's simply divergent and we have to deal with it but not at this moment, we'll deal with it later. Yeah, there is a question. Yes, yes. So now we can, yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. So the process that I'm describing here in great detail for this scalar phi to the fourth theory, it will be exactly the same with all the changes appropriate to that theory if we work in any other theory like Dirac theory, abelian gauge theory, non-abelian gauge theory. For all quantum field theories, as long as we are doing perturbation theory, the relation between uh, endpoint function and free field with this exponential of interaction Hamiltonian is true and then the method to expand it and draw Feynman diagrams is true. Now the vertex may not be 4 point for example, it may be a 3 point vertex in some other theory. In, in electrodynamics it's a 3 point vertex, electron, positron and photon. Okay? So in that case your Feynman diagrams will have 3 point vertices. Moreover, this is all preview, we will be doing this. Moreover, there there will be different kinds of particles. Sometimes the line can represent an electron, sometimes it can represent a photon. In this theory, since there is only one field, all lines represent the same particle and therefore we have df of that particle. Another commutation is that perhaps for the direct you have anti commutator Yes, yes, all that we will do, all that we will do. Okay. Good. So now, let us turn to the four point function and just learn a little bit more technology and most importantly let us try to stress what physical principles we can get by the Feynman diagram, diagram expansion. Now I want to emphasize that the four point function is of crucial importance because after we do enough some manipulations on it so that these fields are not at positions but at fixed momentum by going into momentum space or Fourier space. This kind of thing can represent two particles coming into an experiment scattering and going out as two more particles. Okay, so it's very, very physical. This directly isn't equal to some experimental quantity but by doing some manipulations on this we can actually extract numbers which can be compared with experiments. So the four point function is of crucial importance. Now without writing out the formula, so now once we know Feynman diagrams, we don't need to write out anymore this formula in terms of free fields. We simply say equals and we do the Feynman diagram method which is to put four points x1, x2, x3, x4 and then we decide are we working to zeroth order in the interaction, first order, second order, what? So let's start with zeroth order. Zeroth order means there is no four point vertex on the board. So I have to join these in all possible ways. So how many ways can I do it? Three possible ways. So here is one way and then here is another way and here is the third way. Hmm. So I will label the points instead of x1, x2, x3, x4. I will save my time and write 1, 2, 3, 4. I must keep the labels fixed. Huh? If I fix the labels, then you see that these three diagrams give me different answers. df of 1, 2 times df of 3, 4, df of 1, 4 times df of 2, 3, df of 1, 3 times df of 2, 4. This is the leading order or zeroth order. Hmm? But they are disconnected. Now, they are not completely disconnected and this is part of the definition of completely disconnected. I didn't write the precise definition. Is not connected to any external particles. That is completely disconnected. Here, in fact, every part of the diagram is connected to some external particle. Hmm. So generally the disconnected one means something goes on and then there is some bubble or some loops or something on the side that would be completely disconnected. At this order it can't be there because we have no interactions yet, we are at zeroth order. Hmm. 
I'll give you a terminology, zeroth order in lambda is otherwise called three level. The reason is that the structure of these diagrams in some way resembles trees which are graphs without any closed circuits. You don't see any closed circuits or loops in these graphs. Hmm? Yes, actually you are right. I, probably this is wrong. Yeah, you are quite right. This is first order in lambda. It's tree level. This is free level actually. So this doesn't even deserve a name because this is the process in which each particle propagates into a final state particle without any interaction. So that's fine. Sorry. Yeah, I said something wrong. Let's now go to the first order in lambda. And now we see that so again, same labeling, 1, 2, 3, 4. But now we must put a 4-point interaction somewhere and we must include minus i lambda over 4 factorial for it. Okay. Now, here we can see clearly that if I join 1 with 2 and 3 with 4 and this bubble to itself, then I would have a vacuum diagram or completely disconnected diagram which I have already eliminated, so that that's not there, so I don't draw it. That means I must connect this, at least one of these, to this. Okay. So here's a very simple one. I connect this to this, this to this, this to this, and this to this. And this has a very beautiful physical interpretation. Let's say, now it's up to us to imagine which way time is flowing, but... Uh, so probably I should have labeled it in slightly more friendly way for time to flow. Suppose I was, imagine this was the right thing and time was flowing this way. Particles 1 and 2 come in, they interact at this point and go out as particles 3 and 4. Okay. This diagram is very easy to write down. Minus i lambda over 4 factorial. Okay. Now what is the combinatorial factor for this. Combinatorial factor is 4 factorial because if I start from here, I can land on this interaction in 4 ways. Then I start from here, I can land in 3 ways. Then I start from here, so I can land in 2 ways. So I get 4 factorial. So it's times 4 factorial. And what are the propagators? So this point is y. So what are the propagators in this? Good, everybody knows. df of x1 minus y df of x2 minus y, df of x3 minus y, df of x4 minus y and finally integral d4 y. So this diagram is in fact called tree level and if you have many point function like 6 or 8 point function you can have all kind of branching and all that without loops. But if I keep myself fixed to the four-point function and look for higher order in lambda, then I'll start to get a different class of diagrams. First of all, have I exhausted all these diagrams at this order? Probably not. There's still some more because look, with one, two and three, four and an interaction, I can still say that one propagates into three, two goes to this, and I have a little bubble here. This I can have. Okay. I can have several more of these where I connect one with two or one with four or three. I have the six ways that I connect one pair and then the other pair goes and has this bubble. So many of these. Ah, I'm not going to write down all of these. And that's pretty much it. Now here's a nice physical interpretation for this diagram. What does this suggest? Particle one freely propagates into 3, but particle 2 in the process of propagating into 4 undergoes a self-interaction, okay, which actually converts this propagator to the interacting propagator. You see, we just calculated the interacting propagator and this is a correction to that. Hmm? So, it's actually the particles not interacting with each other but only undergoing self-interaction. So this is an example of a diagram where there is self-interaction.
in the sense that one particle undergoes an interaction and then goes out, while the other one just goes freely. If I went to a higher order, then both could exhibit self-interaction. Okay. In fact, in general order, both will exhibit arbitrary amount of self-interaction, but none of those will be a scattering process. Hmm. These particles didn't scatter. Okay. So, they are important, but they are not as important as this one and its correction. So, it is useful in Feynman diagrams to keep thinking what is the physical meaning of the diagram. Now, in this case, let us go to order lambda squared. And let us not worry about self-interaction type of diagrams. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. And now I have two interaction points, y1 and y2. Okay. And right away, a class of diagrams I can draw look like this. Every line is a propagator. So, df of x2, x1 minus y1, x2 minus y1, x3 minus y2, x4 minus y2, y1 minus y2 and y1 minus y2. You can write it down. Then you can also try to figure out how many diagrams there are like this. Remember that there are also diagrams like this, for example. Uh, supposing I fix the external lines, external points 1, 2, 3, 4, then I can imagine for these two fixed points at y1 and y2 which will be integrated, I could imagine that 2 and 4 meet at a point and 1 and 3 meet at a point. That is different from this diagram. Hmm. Of course, this diagram is often written in this way. It is the same. Where we put the interactions is of no importance. But remember that the external labeling must be always fixed. This is the same. After all, y1 and y2 range over all of space-time. So, where we put them does not make any difference. So, in this one, 1 and 3 meet at a point. In this one, 1 and 2 meet at a point. And there will be even one more kind of diagram where 1 and 4 meet at a point. You can try to work out that type of diagram. So, there are different types of diagrams and each of them has their combinatorial factor. To evaluate these things in completely to momentum space. Yeah, so it is a second order in lambda correction to the scattering process to the four point function. So, I have not told you what is the physical interpretation of the four point function. Okay, there is one step which will take us from four point function as I have defined it, couple of steps which will take us to the scattering matrix from there which will take us to cross section. Okay, so using this quantity we can compute scattering cross section of two particles to go into two particles. That is a measurable physical quantity. This is the second order in lambda correction to that quantity. Yeah. Okay. So, let me just say one thing. You see, we can give physical interpretations to these diagrams, but please remember what we are doing. We are expanding interacting fields in the language of free fields. Okay. Now, nature does not do that. Nature has interacting fields and they interact. Nature is least bothered whether we expand or do not expand them in terms of free fields. It is a technique that we are using to understand the interacting field theory. Okay. Now, if it helps us, then we should give physical interpretations, but we are not obliged to do so. And if the physical interpretation ever gets confusing, you should not make it. Because physical interpretation is not there to confuse us. It is something we give so that we can understand it better. It is created by us. There is no obligation that it has to have a physical interpretation. The only physical quantity is the scattering process. This is our calculation of it. Hmm. But as I go along, I will give you some physical uh, ways of thinking about this. But I warn you, that may not be to everybody's taste. Hmm. I will give you what are my ways of thinking about it. And various books also have their ways of thinking about it. These are ways of thinking about it. Okay. Please do not think that really a particle propagates freely and then once hits some interaction vertex which is sitting in space. There's, look around you, there are no interaction vertices sitting in space, right? Hmm. They are really not there. Okay. But if we calculate something to order lambda squared and get an answer which is 1 millionth percent equal to the measured answer, 
then what it tells us is that all the other virtual processes where there are many more interactions, they contrib contribute negligibly. So it suits us hmm, that there are many other processes, they are all taking place. In quantum mechanics, all processes that are allowed take place, but most of them are unimportant. So we concentrate on the lowest order processes. So this is the spirit of taking physical interpretation. Okay, now you see a beautiful thing about the Feynman propagator as I gave you the formula for it is that it's already expressed as a Fourier transform because it is this, right? So what is it the Fourier transform of? This by definition is the Fourier transform of df tilde of k which is i upon k squared minus m squared. Huh? So, this is the momentum space Feynman propagator. Good. Now, supposing we consider a particular Green's function, well, Green's function is not a term I have been using, we consider a particular endpoint function, then we can transform it into momentum space as follows. Supposing g of x1 up to x2n is this. Uh, do I want the interacting or the free? I guess the interacting. <coughs> Sorry, this is 2n. What I can do is to convert this by Fourier transform by taking integral d for x e to the i k, so d for x i product over all i e to the i k i dot x i times this g. Okay. Do I need two pi's in this also? Probably not. So this is going to be the momentum space endpoint function, which I would like to call g tilde of k1 up to k2n. What I do is each x is converted to a k by Fourier transform. However, there is one little subtlety. That subtlety is that g is translation invariant. That means if I shift the origin of all the x's, okay, then it gives me the same answer because of translation invariance of the theory. So, if I do that over here, it's a very easy exercise to see that the answer will contain a delta function of the sum of all the momenta. Okay, is that physically reasonable thing? Momentum, momentum conservation. So, that means momentum conservation is built into the theory as a consequence of translation invariance. So, we normally factor out the momentum conserving delta, delta for summation k i, whatever is left we call it g tilde. Hmm? So, this is the non-trivial part and we work with this. Now, it becomes extremely easy because for example, look at this diagram. Okay. Now, I don't write x1, x2, x3, x4 anymore. Now, I give momentum labels to the lines. So, this line is k1, this line is k2, this line is k3. I can assign arrows as I like. It doesn't matter if I assign arrows the other way also. Okay. But then the Fourier transforms will be correspondingly affected. So, maybe to have a consistent convention for now, we will just put all the momenta inwards because the sign is up to us, completely arbitrary. Okay. So, this diagram as a Feynman diagram in momentum space, its value is the Feynman propagator for each of these lines in momentum space, which is i upon k1 squared minus m squared, i upon k2 squared minus m squared, i upon 
k3 square minus m square i upon k square minus m square and then uh, there is a delta function always. So, k1 plus up to k4 all are added which means the total momentum flowing into the vertex must be 0. If I change the sign of these arrows then this would be delta of k1 plus k2 minus k3 minus k4 entirely up to me how I do it. Okay. And finally, the combinatorial factors are unaffected by all this. So, it is minus i lambda because there was 4 factorial and there are 4 factorial contractions. So, this is the value of g, this is the contribution to g tilde of k1 to k4. The contribution of first order in lambda. Is that clear? 2 pi to the 4, yeah, I am never sure about 2 pi to the 4, let us see, I must have it somewhere. No, in the momentum it is there, na? all of it is there, I think. Ah. <coughs> yes, that is certainly true. So, here there is a 2 pi to the 4, yes, thank you, that is correct. Okay. And with this, we can also write down. So, let me stop with that one. That is all I wanted to say. Uh, let us go to a more difficult example, which we drew, which is this one. Oh, first a comment from this. Notice that there are no integrations anymore. Hmm. I just write down the Feynman propagator for each of these and there is nothing to integrate. So, this is the answer. Hmm. So, this is the Feynman diagram which we have finished evaluating. That is the answer. Okay. If it was in position space, it would have had one integral d for y, but that integral actually turns out to give us this delta function and everything else is just some factors and this is the final answer for this term. Okay. And this is a gen part of a general feature which is that three level diagrams. So, which is a diagram that does have a momentum integral this one. This is a loop diagram. Now, how would we do this in momentum space? The first thing is this is a correction to that one. So, the labeling better be the same. So, k1, k2, k3, k4. What about these lines in between? These should also have some momentum. Okay. So, let me arbitrarily call it k5 <coughs> and k6. And here we see something very important. Okay. k5 and k6 are not both determined by the external momenta. Okay. The only thing that determines them is, del is momentum conservation at each vertex. Okay. From that you see that at this vertex we get delta of k1 plus k2 plus k6 minus k5 and at the other vertex we get delta of k3 plus k4 plus k5 minus k6. Okay. Now, if I this is a product of 2. In any delta, I can insert the 0 of the other delta. That is a formula satisfied by delta functions. Okay. So, I can, in, uh, I can replace k6 minus k5 as k3 plus k4 in this delta function because it is set in this delta function. So, this is this. But this I always, always expected. This is overall. The answer will have this multiplying the contribution in every order of lambda because this is overall momentum conservation. This is extra and it determines k6 in terms of k3, k4 and k5. So, in this diagram I can write this as k3 plus k4 plus k5. I could have even guessed it because I could have said look at this vertex k5 is coming in, k3 is coming in, k4 is coming in. So, the sum of all three must be going out. Hmm? That is clear. So, what about k5? Is it fixed by anything? Okay. So, it is not fixed. 
So the only possibility must be that we have to integrate this in K5. Hmm. And in fact, if you start with the position space representation and derive this momentum space diagram, you will find that there is a single integral in K5. Okay. What does it integrate? All the things that depend on K5. This is K5 squared minus M squared. And this one is K3 plus K4 plus K5 squared minus M squared. <coughs> All the other factors just depend on K1, K2, K3, K4. So, they are not inside the integral. Okay. Is this clear? And this is part of a general rule which says loop diagrams involve one momentum integral per loop. Okay, here is one loop, this is one closed loop, one momentum integral. It is a general feature. Okay. So, now I want to leave you with a interesting thought. What constraint is there on these external momenta k1, k2, k3, k4? They describe some particle of mass m, right? So, any of these k's satisfies k squared equals m squared. What about this k? is completely arbitrary. It does not have to satisfy k squared equals m squared. In fact, that is why there are poles in the propagator. Huh? But this is integrated in d4 k5. That means every component of k5 goes from minus to plus infinity. So, this is a completely arbitrary or you could say not physical momentum. It does not have to satisfy k squared equals m squared. Now, the physical interpretation people give, but you should take it with all the warnings I gave you. external particles satisfy k i squared equals m squared and this anything that satisfies this is called on shell internal that is propagating in loops do not satisfy, this is what it means. It means that when we try to calculate physical processes in perturbation theory, we can express them as if there are some free particles propagating in loops, which are virtual, which have not got physical momenta and whose only job is to communicate the interaction between the incoming and the outgoing particles. So, they contribute to the process. Okay, but it is an interpretation of the diagram. It is not that we write the diagram by knowing there are virtual particles. We write the diagram using Wick's theorem and we interpret the diagram in language of virtual particles. Yeah, there is a question. Yes, so off shell and on shell refers to the mass shell. The mass shell is the space described, the curve if you like in momentum space described by k squared equals m squared. So, as I said, yeah, so external particles must be on shell because any physically measurable particle is so, but these are not physically measurable particles. These are quantum mechanical effects. Uh, no, even in a three point there would be loops, but the loops might look different. For example, if you look at a toy three point theory, here is an example of a loop. These are all three point interactions, but you still see a loop. So, you can get loops in any theory with any interactions 3 point or higher. That is correct. To lowest order they want. To lowest order this process will be like this. But then this also to lowest order this is this. To lowest order this has no loops. The new thing that this has is a internal particle which is off shell but not arbitrary. It is K1 plus K2. That is a new feature. K1 plus K2 squared is not M squared, but nor is it uh, totally virtual in the sense there is no integral for this. So, this also can happen. So, probably one should say that uh, internal particles do not satisfy this. They might be in loops or they might not be in loops. Yeah. 
Okay, I've gone on a bit over time, so I think I'll stop.